<laughs> well, guys, that is the signal that we are right at noon. So thank you for joining us noon if you're on the East Coast uh, and morning if you're on the West Coast. Uh, today's topic, threat assessment and response, I just want folks to know that this, like every week, uh, is a topic that we try to share perspective as it relates to crisis services. Um, this week, the topic can be difficult. Um, it's a very important one, one that we should not shy away from, but recognize that for many people, this may be a triggering conversation. Uh, so we just want to make sure that you uh, take care of yourselves. Uh, if you need to take a break and step away, please do. Uh, and feel free to rejoin us when you can. Um, but but it, like I said, this uh, is a topic that we try to, uh, or at least a perspective that we try to share every week, you know, making sure that we are diving into the various aspects of implementation and crisis services. Uh, so uh, we don't want to uh, bypass this topic, but also want to make sure that folks are taking care of themselves as needed. So uh, moving on today, uh, happy to have really strong participation. As Vic mentioned, we are over uh, 2,000, six short from 3,000 strong. So if you have any friends or colleagues, please encourage them to join our learning community, sign up for uh, the newsletters. Uh, feel free to watch it on YouTube if you cannot join us during this hour. Uh, we wanna make sure that this information, these best practices are being shared widely. Um, next slide. Also, perhaps the calendar uh, invite fell off of your Outlook, so feel free to download uh, the new updated uh, calendar reminder so that you have it standing every week. Uh, you can download and import them uh, using the links below. Uh, of course, there's always the website talk.crisisnow.com uh, where you can join the Zoom link immediately. You can sign up for the newsletters. You can see past crisis jams. You can order a t-shirt, uh, tease out the various segments if you're looking for something specific uh, and may not recall what week it happened. You can go to uh, a certain uh, quote and see all the quotes. You can go to the hot seat and see all the hot seat questions. And of course you can sign up and uh, never miss a thing. All right, and then as a reminder, we will be off next week, or I'm sorry, we will be off the week of October 5th. Uh, and so the following week, October 12th, it will be the 100th jam session. And there will be a challenge uh, that will take place during that session. Uh, cannot give all the details, but uh, it will be very exciting and we hope that you will join us for that. Next slide. All right, so wanted to go through some of the news articles that have come out recently related to crisis services. One from PBS, uh, Ken Burns, who is famous for doing the um, Civil War and, and other historical documentaries has a new uh, film or is presenting a new film called Hiding in Plain Sight, focusing in on youth mental illness. Um, so very important. And I believe we're dropping that link into the chat. Uh, the Soso Zay Foundation, which is the um, foundation arm of OTSCA, uh, has a phenomenal uh, podcast series called Call for Help. Uh, really encourage folks to take a listen. Uh, they do a lot of really great work focusing in on mental health and decriminalizing mental health. Um, so, and oh, it looks like Justin Volpe is in the uh, documentary. So thank you, Justin. He'll be part of our round table later today. Um, this NPR article uh, talking about some of the social media posts that warn folks not to call, chat, or text with 988. There are a, a number of misinformation pieces that have been going around on social media. So this article helps lay out what folks um, need to know around 988. And, and of course, Dr. John Draper from Vibrant, uh, Vibrant Emotional Health serves as the administrator of the 988 Suicide and Crisis Lifeline uh, is also uh, quoted in that, I believe. So uh, feel free to take a look. 
And uh, this is the No Surprises Act. I'm actually going to see if Angela Kimball from Inseparable has joined us and wanted to, to talk a little bit about this No Surprises Act. Angela, sure. Yeah, thank you, Laura. I, I'm on. So just last Friday, the Department of Labor, HHS, and the Treasury released uh, FAQs about the No Surprises Act. And thanks to our friends at the Kennedy Forum, we were alerted to question number 10, which outlines how the regulations governing health plan coverage of emergency services apply to a behavioral health crisis facility. So what does this mean? Uh, it's challenging legalese, at least for me, but basically uh, this language says that state licensed crisis receiving and stabilization facilities that provide services that meet the definition of emergency services must be covered without prior authorization and without regard to provider network uh, status. What this means too is no cost sharing for patients that is more than for in-network providers. So basically, just as if you were in an accident and taken to an emergency department and that would be covered, uh, so must behavioral health crisis facilities. This does not apply to mobile crisis, but it's still a significant step forward for parity coverage, uh, thanks to the Department of Labor, HHS and the Treasury. Tip of the hat to Washington State, which passed HB 1688 earlier this year, in which the state defined emergency services to include crisis stabilization and mobile crisis. Uh, David Lloyd at the Kennedy Forum, along with Inseparable and some of our other partners, met with federal uh, agency staff this year to discuss how the administration might similarly, similarly assert that behavioral health crisis services fall under existing emergency service definitions and requirements. So we were thrilled when this came out and hope this uh, takes us on a step forward towards insurance coverage of the crisis continuum of care. Thanks, Laura. Thank you, Angela. Thank you for helping us go through that. Uh, and there's also a link in the chat if anyone wants to see the actual rule. Our quote this week comes from Roger Martin, the author of The Opposable Mind. Uh, and the quote here is to hold two conflicting ideas in constructive tension. So the, this is the, the notion that this is an evolutionary breakthrough, sort of like our opposable thumbs, uh, and that we need to have the ability to hold these uh, two conflicting ideas uh, in our minds. So with that, I will move on to the next slide where uh, Dr. Jack Roselle will share his presentation, The Other Side of the Coin, um, you see his bio here, uh, but I will also note that we are proud to have him in the Lifeline Network. Thank you. Uh, it's a privilege to be here. You know, I've been part of these calls I, almost since the beginning in early COVID days, and uh, I, I'm looking forward to talking to you a little bit about uh, my world and, and the work I do, which uh, is a blend of a, a lot of emergency mental health and a lot of emergency psychiatry and a lot of work around violence and violence prevention. And as I think most of you appreciate, uh, the boundary between those two areas is, you know, th there's quite a big interface between them, right? Um, and traditional crisis services, as we know, have always been centered on suicide prevention, right? Uh, mostly, right? But I think the toolkit that we've done for suicide prevention, for most crisis services blend very well uh, into the area of violence prevention. Services are accessed. Uh, what the interventions are that are offered and what are the values that underlie the work. And through my role with the American Association for Emergency Psychiatry uh, and now the immediate past president, uh, we've put a lot of emphasis and a lot of focus on how do we get better at managing people at that interface. Next slide, please. Now, a few years ago, I also had uh, the great privilege of working with the Vibrant team uh, when they wanted to pull together some great resources on what our network resource centers can do, uh, or what our network centers can do about preventing and working with people at risk for violence. And we were able to pull together a really wonderful team of folks from a lot of different backgrounds of crisis work, of violence prevention work, of forensics, uh, as well as some of the core leadership of Vibrant at the time, right? Now, before we go to the next slide, I wanna ask something special of you, right? This is 
probably one of the most jam-packed hours that a lot of us have in the week. It's really the most jam-packed webinar I, I, I get to. Um, but I want you to sit with me for eight seconds of silence, and then we'll talk about the significance of that eight seconds. Next slide. Click it, please. Ah, there we go. On July 12th, 2012, uh, at a midnight showing at a movie theater in Colorado, a gunman killed 12 people and 70 more people were wounded. Countless more, the survivors, the families, the first responders continued to live with the immeasurable trauma and grief of, of those short minutes that night. In the moments before the assailant re-entered the theater, having armed himself in his car, he called a crisis line. Uh, leading up to the trial, he told Bill Reed, a, a court-appointed forensic psychiatrist, that he called the crisis line to see if he should turn back. He stated that when he called, he didn't hear anything. Uh, the electronic records indicate that the call connected for about eight or nine seconds. The crisis worker said it was a silent call that spontaneously ended. Dr. Reed asked the assailant uh, and said, you know, what do you think they would have done uh, if he'd spoken to someone? He said, well, I, I think they would have tried to talk me out of it. Would they have been successful? No, he didn't think so. But today I'd like to talk to you about what if, what if uh, he had gotten through to one of those crisis workers? What, what if one of our crisis staff had a chance to speak to that person at risk? And I think, as we all know in the field, our, our teams work with people like this all the time. And the question is, how can we do better? Next slide, please. Well, when you dive into the research, what we know is that the overlap between suicide and aggression and violence is substantial. We know that violent behavior is a really good risk factor for uh, estimating suicide risk and thinking about suicide risk. We know that when we're concerned about violence, that suicidality and suicidal behaviors are a very strong risk factor for that aggression. And that if you were to draw out a list of sort of what are our top risk factors for the violence, what are our top risk factors uh, for suicide, what we get is a, a fairly overlapping type of list, right? Um, and we also know that when we follow over time that people who make high level homicidal threats, right? So high level enough that they end up under legal scrutiny, you follow them out over time, the person they're most likely to kill is themselves. And when we look um, about some of the barriers to violence, you know, this idea of reckless ambivalence, this lack of concern about one's own life or well-being, uh, plays a significant role. And we know that when we look at uh, major violent acts, mass shooting types of events, suicide and suicide by uh, cop are frequent outcomes uh, for these terrible events. Next slide. When we look at the research around mass shooters or, or targeted violence, some of these uh, you know, more substantial types of things, one of the first things I'll say is that most of the data suggests that mental illness and especially severe mental illness don't play that much of a role, right? Despite the public discourse of those people, they must have been, someone must have been mentally ill to engage in something like that. Most of the time, as best as we can tell, that they weren't. But we do know some other things about them, right? So one data set by uh, Jill Peterson and Dinsley uh, called the Violence Project that's gotten a lot of uh, media attention recently, uh, looking at their school shooter data set, two thirds of them were suicidal before or during the event. Uh, and uh, seven out of eight of them were in some kind of a crisis. A U.S. Secret Service study lo looking at about 10 years of data said about 40% were suicidal and 100%, 100% of them had significant stressors, uh, at least half of that happening within the prior two days. Some FBI behavioral analysis unit data says substantial numbers, maybe a third die by suicide. When we look at the pre-attack cycles of a lot of people engaged in serious acts of violence, about half of them had had some kind of suicidal thoughts or behavior before the attack, uh, and almost 100% showed some type of stressor uh, in, in the time leading up to the event. And I would suggest to you that we work with teams, we work with systems that are very well attuned to helping people who are suicidal, to helping people who are in crisis. And I think our opportunity uh, to perhaps intervene, not because we're necessarily targeting violence itself, but because we have created a really great tool that helps us help people uh, who may do well with our interventions. It's a nice opportunity to, to leverage what we know and what we do to reduce some of that violence risk. Next slide. Now, there's a niche field, it's called threat management. 
Uh, it's about sort of how we work together in multidisciplinary teams to prevent uh, targeted acts of violence. And one of our, our you know, aphorisms is you got to collect the dots before you can connect the dots, right? So you got to sort of pull all the little pieces of evidence together, right? But a big part before you can even start collecting the dots is someone out there has to say, ah, I'm seeing something concerning. I'm seeing some kind of a behavior. They posted online on social media. They made a comment, you know, in the workplace break room and said, ah, I should just come back into the gun. Something ominous, something concerning. So someone has to recognize, hey, that's important concerning information. And then they have to have some place that they know that they can hand that information off to that they trust. Because oftentimes those bystanders who we want to become upstanders are the friends or the coworkers uh, or the peers or the fellow students of that person at risk for violence. And they have a lot of different reasons why they worry about their own safety if they share that information indiscriminately about what happens to them, about what happens to that person of interest. And you know what? Crisis centers and, and crisis lines are a really good answer to that question of who do I trust with this information, right? We are good, safe receivers for this information. And through our work, we hear both that leakage, which is that indirect threat of someone saying, hey, you know, I heard them say this, or, you know, if someone, instead of making a threat directly at a target, they say, hey, guess what, I'm going to go kill so-and-so, right? And now you're the bystander who want to become the upstander because, you know, I'm going to go kill so-and-so. I'm not going to kill so-and-so, don't worry, right? But you've got this information, and we want someone to do something with that, raise it up, right? And it's not necessarily that the crisis centers are going to be the end-all, be-all problem solver for all of this but they have a chance to receive this information and at least be thoughtful about how, when, and where they pass that information on. Next slide. Three core questions that I think we should all uh, be thinking about as we say, how is my crisis team gonna work with you know, people at risk for violence? One of the first questions is, what are the, like, the, the, what are the rules of the road, right? So what are the laws, the rules, the regulations specific to my program, how I'm licensed, how I'm regulated, how we exist legally? Uh, that either tell us what we must do when we hear about this information or what we may do. It might be terrorist off duties and voluntary commitment, you know, boundaries around confidentiality and privilege. Uh, some states have things called ex extreme risk protective orders that allow limited interventions and firearm access, right? Uh, and a couple resources uh, to think about right off the bat to get more information, uh, if you could just sort of click for the next bullet item. Uh, the National Council on State Legislatures has a really nice website. If you just Google NCSL, mental health professional duty to warrant, it will tell you probably what the current state standard is for wherever you might be, right? The next question is who are we partnering with, right? Never worry alone is an important adage in our field, right? Um, who do we partner with to manage these tricky cases? It could be uh, legal folks, it could be our risk managers, subject matter consultants. It could be that officer detective on the CIT team that we work with all the time that we've developed a really good rapport with. Um, Across the country, we have a, a large number of members of an organization called uh, the Association of Threat Assessment Professionals Worldwide. Uh, Dr. Thrasher, the current president of AAEP, and I were just there the other week uh, presenting about some of the work we're doing. And there's a lot of great resources at that website, including finding your local chapter and, and sort of local leaders to partner with, right? And then finally, like, what's the training that we can give to our team? And what are the practices that help us care for people at risk for engaging in violence? Now, if you're lucky enough to be one of the uh, Lifeline Network partners and you go to the uh, Network Resource Center online, if you just uh, search the term violence or threat management, you will go to a whole bunch of resources that we put together over the past few years for uh, the membership. Also, the National Council for Behavioral Health, which is rebranded a few times uh, already, uh, have a, has a great report on mass violence in America. And there's another great document from the FBI called Making Prevention a Reality that talks about how that happens. Next slide. And if you want to take away something simple, like something you can start using right away, this is a, 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 a mnemonic that Amy Barnhorst, who's a psychiatrist out in California, uh, and I put together, we were both part of that uh, vibrant team uh, looking at what we can do for our crisis centers. And, you know, it's simple mnemonic, right? So take all threats seriously or investigate any threat. So a threat is either the direct threat, like, hey, I'm coming to your crisis center to get you, right? We've, my center's dealt with more than a few of those, I can tell you, right? Or leakage, hey, I'm going to go get so-and-so, right? When you hear that stuff, you start to dig a little bit deeper. Is there a history of violence, especially with the identified target or similar targets, right? Have they gotten in physical or violent altercations or made threats over and over again in that dyad and that relationship? We get concerned. Recent stressors, relationships, money, housing, employment, 
medical issues, violent victimization, right? All of these things increase imminent risk for violence. Now it's, we think about acuity and recency, right? So if I was abused as a kid, I've got some risk of violence. If someone beat the stuff out of me last night, my risk goes way up, right? I've been single for a while, I've got some risk, I just got dumped, my risk goes way up, right? And by the way, we've added all of those stressors to the environment. Eth e, ethanol or other drug use, specifically current or recent intoxication that we worry about. Uh, a, agitated or annoyed easily, that hostile attributional style. Why are you asking me this information? Don't you people keep records, blah, blah, blah. I'm not telling you that, right? If everything's bristly, you're more likely to pop off and get violent. An external attributional style, they don't take responsibility. It was someone else's responsibility to do that. Now I'm getting in trouble. Everyone steals things from the office. They stole stuff all the time. Why am I getting in trouble? Well, you stole a photocopier. The other people stole a marker, right? Suicidality and increasing hopelessness. Often one of the barriers to not commit violence uh, is what are the consequences for me? But if I've given up on my own safety, then uh, I'm a lot less concerned uh, about hurting someone else. S, symptomatic psychiatric illnesses, especially psychotic illnesses. But again, most people with mental illness are not violent, not to themselves or anybody else, uh, but it can be a very manageable risk factor sometimes. And finally, a specific target, target access means and things. All right, and then we'll discuss this for a little bit. Uh, if there's ever anything I can do, that is my email uh, and my Twitter handle up there that I share with the wonderful Dr. Lila Solomon, another forensic psychiatrist. And we would be honored if you uh, might think about joining us at the uh, American Association for Emergency Psychiatry's annual meeting. And if you happen to be in Pittsburgh uh, next week for CIT, uh, look for me. I'd, I'd love to sit and chat with you. Um, and even if I don't see you, welcome to Pittsburgh for those of you joining us. Great. Thank you, Jack. That was a really great presentation. And I um, know you referenced some materials that are available on the Network Resource Center that is limited to crisis centers in the Lifeline Network, but we'll share, we'll be happy to share other documents and items that could be helpful for folks who are not in the network. Um, so look for that. Um, but that resource center itself is a, does require a Lifeline Center um, login. So I'm going to bring together our roundtable. Uh, we have Justin Volpe, who is a peer support specialist with NASHBID. Uh, Shannon Jacquard, who is this uh, adjunct professor at Alliant University and also with the Aspen Global Leadership Network. And then Dr. Thomas Joyner, who is a professor of psychology at Florida State University. So if you all would like to uh, turn on your microphones and turn on your cameras, uh, we'll start with you, Justin. Any thoughts or feedback on the presentation? Oh uh, yeah, it was uh, it was it was great. I love I love how it's stressed that you know people with serious mental health issues um, are more likely to be victims of crimes and violence than to be committing them. And I think you know the media you know attaches itself to to stigmas and to to, to clickbait, and it really paints us in a poor image. And as a person in long-term recovery and lived experience, it, it's very hurtful. And it's hard enough uh, as a citizen in this country to see some of these things happen. But when you see the attacks turn on people um, that are struggling, you know, it, it, it can make or break you. And I, and I love the education and, and, and the advocacy put forward in it. Yeah, so much of the dialogue uh, in the wake of the high profile events is that people want to, it's the sense of othering and saying, oh, you know, I don't want to think of myself as someone who could possibly do that. So I'm going to point my finger somewhere else. Um, and it's stigmatizing, it's damaging. We have evidence uh, that that poor media coverage and that poor messaging, you know, drives people away from accessing services, right? Absolutely. Um, I think there's so much stigma and it, and it does turn people to, um, you know, uh, illegal substances too, because it, there's so much stigma to get help, to go wait in line um, and to admit you have a serious mental health issue when that's what's being identified on the news. Thanks, Justin. I'll turn to Shannon. Uh, any thoughts that you'd like to share? I, I really loved your presentation. I, I love the threats times three 
essentially a good uh, monarch to remember. And in fact, I would love to have that to, to share with other individuals because people do focus on what they receive, the message they're receiving which is just from the media's perspective, which goes back to mental illness oftentimes. And this really kind of would help to shape um, both their viewpoint when situations like this happen and to help prevent future situations from happening. So um, just from that perspective, I would love to have that one slide just to share with other individuals in my... I will drop links for the article that came from as well as a few other uh, reports into the chat for folks. Uh, that article is actually open access thanks to Dr. Barnhorst's funding, so. That would be great. Yeah, years ago, I think it was after um, Sandy Hook shooting, Wall Street Journal came out with some really good articles and deviated a, away uh, completely from stigmatizing mental illness to kind of the state and why this was happening uh, why certain individuals were taking this route um, versus taking other routes. That was really good. I can't find it again, but that's another one that I'd like to share. But thank you. Go ahead, Dr. Joyner. Sure, thank you. Um, Dr. Roselle mentioned uh, a book, or actually not a psychiatrist named Bill Reed, William Reed. Dr. Reed has written a book called A Dark Night in Aurora about that incident that Dr. Roselle mentioned in Colorado, the theater shooting, the movie theater shooting. And I, I recommend that book uh, heartily. Um, it's, it, it's, it's disturbing reading in a way because the incident was disturbing, but uh, the way that Dr. Reed sort of understands the, the perpetrator's mindset is, is very illuminating. Um, Dr. Roselle pointed out that, that we in the suicide prevention community we already have a head start on understanding violence assessment and violence prevention uh, because when we're when we're working on suicide prevention, we are working on the prevention of harm, the prevention of harm to a person. And that's what violence is too. In both cases, I'll, I'll again, this is an uncomfortable truth, but in both cases, harm is involved of some sort, violence is involved often. And, and, and of course there's a difference that is self-directed versus other directed, but there's a large overlap too. So it makes a lot of sense that we would be well positioned to, to assess and, and mitigate both. I, I would underscore one last um, point and it's that uh, Dr. Roselle mentioned, and I think, I think the term was an external attributional style as part of the, as part of the threats um, system, blaming others in other words. And I think that's pretty key and a useful differentiator. Again, there's a lot of overlap between um, suicide potential and violence potential, but one differentiator perhaps is a tendency, an overall tendency to blame others versus to blame the self with self-blaming tendencies being a little bit more towards the suicidal end of things and other blaming things, other blaming tendencies being a little bit more towards the, the violence side of things. Um, I'll stop there. Thank you. It's an excellent point. Yeah, uh, thank you all for uh, for being a part of this roundtable. And there's some questions that have come in through the chat um, that I just want to post to all of you and, and Dr. Rosell, you as well. Uh, if I go back to the initial question from Monica Luke, uh, any advice on messaging? Uh, this is a very nuanced topic. Uh, so any advice on uh, how to manage the nuanced messaging, what is needed uh, kind, of, kind of from the, from the social media aspect, uh, from the, the call centers, uh, any advice, any thoughts, feedback that the round table or Dr. Rizal would like to share? Yeah, uh, reportingonmassshootings.org, uh, which was a partnership between a number of groups, including SAVE, the Pointer Institute, which is sort of a big journalism think tank, uh, and a number of subject matter experts, gives a number of really nice uh, key points on how to talk about uh, mass violent events. Um, also, you know, it's a little bit of a broader, uh, deeper dive. There's a great book by a colleague of mine, Mark Fullman, who's the U.S. editor for Mother Jones Magazine, uh, who's really done a deep dive into the broader 
uh, issues of how we prevent these types of terrible acts. But he's also done a lot of incredible work on the journalism and, and the impact of the journalism about some of these events and, you know, the so-called Columbine effect. It's a great book. It's called Trigger Points. Uh, I get no commission on that, <laughs> but uh, he owes me a couple beers. So uh, I'll, I'll put the tab on that. Right. Great. Any uh, other uh, roundtable members want to chime in before we wrap up? All right. Well, Dr. Rizal, thank you. It's such a, a great presentation. Um, and, and again, a topic that does need to be discussed. Uh, I see there's been some leaks dropped into the chat with, with more to come. So thank you for that. Um, I'm sorry, could could you say one more time, Dr. Rizal, the website for reporting? Um, I want to say it's reporting on mass shootings.org. I will drop it into the chat. I will uh, triple check that and drop that. There's a couple other really nice uh, resources on that theme as well. Um, and I saw some saying, can you share book recommendations? I'll drop a bunch of stuff in the chat. As you might have noticed, I got a book issue. Uh, <laughs> and I, I'm happy to, to share my uh, habits with you. So. All right, well, perfect. We will look forward to those book uh, recommendations. Uh, so moving on, uh, of course, we have the 988 Jam t-shirts. Uh, they are available in Spanish and English and in multiple colors. So if you would like to order one, feel free to go to talk.crisisnown.com slash learning community, and you will find uh, how to order a shirt. Not sure if anyone uh, I is, is wearing a shirt today. I know a lot of folks have their cameras off for our uh, interpreters, uh, but uh, feel free to turn on your camera and highlight if you have a shirt. You can get this shirt, of course, by ordering one or, or by participating into the uh, with the Crisis Jam hot seat, which is our next segment. Okay, there we go. Paul has his shirt. Leanne is wearing her shirt. <laughs> Thank you both. Uh, Gary has his order, so we will see more next week. If we move on to the next slide. For today's hot seat, we have Dr. Stephanie Woodard from Nevada joining us today. Uh, Stephanie, can you come off mute and turn on your video? I am off mute. Can you hear me? Yes. Thank okay. you. We can see you. Great. Well, you have the uh, honor of being in the hot seat today and a t-shirt again up for grabs. Uh, the question this week comes from um, Dr. Joyner's work uh, related to murder suicides. Uh, so the question is when published, you know, at the time of the, uh, of that, the that his work was published, per Perversion of Virtue, uh, there were 105 uh, suicides per day on average in the U.S. Of that 105 suicides that occurred daily, how many of those were murder suicides? Ooh, this is a tough question. I don't know. Do I have an opportunity to phone a friend? You do. You can bring someone up. You can ask the audience. Maybe we should pull up. Let's ask the audience. I imagine the audience has some uh, good ideas here. All right. We will get that poll up shortly. While we're getting that poll up, Dr. Woodard, anything you want to talk us through here? Excellent presentation um, just earlier talking about the need uh, to lean in on threat assessments. I think that for many people, there has been a, a stark differentiation between threat assessments for violence versus those of suicide. Um, and I think especially as uh, we work to further some of the work of the, the crisis centers, um, specifically understanding how um, all of the crisis continuum can help to uh, interrupt potentially uh, the risk for uh, of, um, violence that have a, a great opportunity um, to leverage some of the collective wisdom that we have around suicide prevention. Um, so I, I just thought that was an incredibly enlightening presentation. All right, thank you. And we are having a little bit of trouble with the poll, so I will give it another few seconds or so. Dr. Woodard, I'm not sure if there's someone else you want to call on, but um, I'll just note too, I thought, I thought um, again, the recognition that 
people suffering from mental illness uh, are, are more likely to be victims than perpetrators. I think that's also something that we need to get out. I am sorry, uh, I cannot see the poll, but can you all see the poll? I can see the poll. Um, and so survey says uh, C, two to three. So I will go with the collective wisdom of the audience and offer that as my answer today. All right, perfect. Let's see how you did. Great. Yes, you got it right. It's two to three. Uh, this is actually one that I um, missed in our pre-show. Uh, so of the 105 suicides that occur on a daily basis in the U.S., two to three would be considered murder suicides. Uh, again, this is uh, not common, uh, but these tragedies do occur daily, and that, that's something that we need to have a conversation around, um, and it does loom large in the media um, but, but really this is, this is a very uncommon phenomenon. Uh, I'm going to see if there, if Dr. Joyner, since this is his work, wants to add a, a few words. Sure. The book came out, it's called the Perversion of Virtue, as Laura mentioned, and it came out at this point about eight years ago. And, and unfortunately, since then, the, the overall suicide rate in the United States is has most, for the most part, gone up. And so now we get more than 105 suicides per day, more like 120 or 25, somewhere in there. But that that percentage of the number of the overall suicides that are murder suicides has remained pretty constant. It's usually between two and 3%. So if you do the math with 105 suicides per day back in 2014, you get two to three. Um, nowadays, though, um, because there's been an increase overall in suicide, there will be slightly more than that. Probably today, the answer would be more like three or four uh, per day. The, the remarkable thing, at least in my view, is that there, there really is not a day in the United States, never mind the rest of the world, there's not a day that passes where, where a murder-suicide has not occurred. It's a daily event, as Laura said. It's, it's a really important form of violence to understand. Yes, it's rare on the one hand, but on the other hand, when you add that up, we're talking about a thousand people, um, you know, who who die by suicide, and then another thousand who are killed by them, at least. So it's it's rare in one sense, but in another sense, for the families involved, for example, it doesn't seem or feel rare at all. I'll stop there. Yeah, thanks, Dr. Joyner. Um, Stephanie, you will get your t-shirt uh, for participating. And if anyone is interested in participating in the hot seat, feel free to reach out to Karen. Um, I'm gonna hand it over now to Stephanie Hepburn to talk through the latest Crisis Talk article. Thanks, Laura. So I'd like to welcome Dr. Marsha Ford. Um, participants on the jam will have seen her previous presentation, uh, but she's the former president of the American Association of Poison Control Centers, and she and I talked about the history of the poison centers and how they came to be, uh, but what really stood out to me, Dr. Ford, if you're on the call, was your point that there needs to be coordination and connectivity between the poison centers and 988. Can you share why that's important? Sure. Um, can you hear me okay? Can you hear me? I can, yes. Okay, great, all right. So um, Dr. Roselle uh, had his three questions and one, part of one of the questions was who should we, meaning not at a part or partner with, and he mentioned subject matter experts. And that's exactly uh, what poison centers could supply to 988. Uh, and I wanna say that it would be reciprocal because there are times when it would be uh, great uh, poison center wise, if we could access the expertise of a 988 expert. Um, so that's really where I'm coming from. And, and let's don't forget EMS and here, and you have EMS on the slide mm -hmm. um, as a third participant in trying to figure out what's the best place for care for this patient. Um, so that's, that's really, it, it sounds simple, but boy, it'll require a lot of work on a national level as well as on the local levels. Um, the 988 providers would need to work with whatever poison center is supplying their area because that poison center is going to be familiar with the, um, um, you know, the hospitals, the, the facilities that are available, that sort of thing. Um, 
but that's that's really why I think there needs to be um, or participating together because of the subject matter content and the expertise that poison centers can supply. And the example you gave is somebody who might have made a suicide attempt that there wasn't, it, the level wasn't um, high in terms of potential danger to themselves in terms of um, ingestion, but there was the danger and is the danger of the suicide attempt. Can you talk a little bit about how that could work in, in you know, the ideal world? Well, let's say the poison center gets a call and um, we figure out that this is not, um, a worrisome ingestion mm -hmm. based on the history we've gotten. Um, but we are concerned about the fact that the patient has admitted and we get, I think, 18% of our calls uh, we think are either from somebody who's trying to do self-harm or misusing or whatever. Um, that's the kind of thing that we could transfer to 988 for evaluation. Um, 988 might get a call from somebody who has taken something and they would go through their initial triage, but then they might want to transfer to a poison center to find out, is this the sort of thing that we need to be worried about and call 911 and get EMS to take the patient to the hospital, that sort of thing. And um, there are toxins. And in this article, uh, there were several cases where one was a child, uh, well, two were children, but also with adults. It's either the amount doesn't seem to be much, but we, the poison center experts, know that these toxins don't take much to kill. Right. Or they're what I call the toxic time bombs, where you drink uh, ethylene glycol, which is antifreeze, well, you might not get sick for six to 12 hours. Uh, so, uh, you know, the, the, the television, somebody drinks something and they drop dead immediately. That's not how it happens. And... Um, so we would supply expertise in those areas because we know what to be worried about that might not be looking bad now, but has the potential to be seriously ill or killed. Thank you so much for coming on the call, Dr. Ford. And I'll pass it back to you, Laura. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having me. And thanks for the work y'all are doing. Yes, thank you both, Dr. Ford and Stephanie. Really great article. I encourage folks to take a look if they haven't read it already. Um, again, I think it highlights the importance of getting folks to the correct um, um, poison control center based on where they are in their physical location. And again, that's important both for poison control as well as for people who are in crisis. So you can connect locally uh, first. So let's move forward to the next slide, please. All right. And this is part of a relatively newer uh, segment. Uh, forecasting or providing that lived lens for 988. And I'm going to turn it over to Kana in, uh, Inamoto, who is the director of the Brain Health Trust. Hi there, uh, good afternoon. Um, you know, I think I was just gonna say a little bit about my renewed passion in behavioral health after having $35 doesn't know they're not on mute. There you go. Um, but yeah, I just um, had the great pleasure of dropping my daughter off at college this last week. And it was um, a really poignant moment because I realized that a few years ago, we didn't know if she was going to make it. We, um, you know, it was really touch and go. We had multiple hospitalizations, lots of trips to the emergency department. And one thing that was consistent throughout our experience was the wish that there was somewhere else to go. Um, you know, we we knew uh, after, I think we were tallying it up, we probably spent all together like 10 days in the ED um, across a couple of different visits. But, you know, sh she said, why are people with mental illnesses punished? Um, for being sick, like nobody else gets punished in the same way when they go to the emergency department, is that's her perception. I'm sure there are other um, conditions for which it's not, it's also not very pleasant. Um, but I think we, we, the two of us had a chance to talk about it, about how, 
helpless and dehumanizing um, the experience made us feel. And, um, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't obvious that she was going to make it through, but I'm, I'm really glad that we were able to access the kinds of services and supports that did work for her and for our family. Uh, and I'm grateful to many of the people on the call for the work that they, they did to help us back then and that all of you continue to do to make sure that better resources are available to young people and families uh, that are, are respectful and supportive and appropriate for the time and the, and the situation uh, that they need. Great, thank you, Kana, and thank you for sharing your experience uh, on, on both sides here. So really appreciate you uh, sharing that. Um, okay, let's move forward to the next slide and I'm gonna turn it over to Eitan Raskis to give us a SAMHSA update. Hi everyone, um, it is always impossible act to follow Kana, uh, but I will do my best. And I just do wanna also echo Kana's words of gratitude and appreciation for everyone on the call who um, does make those crisis services uh, possible in, in moments um, like, like Brandon experienced. Um, and so much of the work that we are doing in the 98 office is trying to reinforce that both at the lifeline level, but also across the broader continuum. Um, and so a couple of uh, quick updates on those fronts. Uh, on the 98 operations side, we continue to see improvements in the performance of the lifeline, especially for chats and texts. Uh, and we are working actively with Vibrant to improve user experience for people in crisis who call the line and expect more data to be released in the coming weeks. Um, second, on the 988 comms and engagement end, many of you have hopefully seen the 988 print and social media shareables that are available in the SAMHSA store. And as September approaches with Suicide Prevention Awareness Month, we want to encourage everyone on the call to find continuous ways to spread awareness about 98 um, through some of those materials. I think we have been constantly receiving new inventory through the SAMHSA store. Some of those supplies flew off the shelf around July 16th, but there are new magnets and wallet cards and, and posters and lots of other active ways to promote 98 that are being posted on there. So I would encourage everyone to uh, check that out and I will post the link in the chat momentarily. And then third, uh, more broadly, and especially in the context of what Kana shared and some of Raina's story, I do also want to amplify the recent CMS actions that were released last week on August 18th. CMS published two informational bulletins focusing on ways to leverage Medicaid and CHIP for youth behavioral health services. There's also a proposed rule on reporting requirements that is worth taking a look at as well. Uh, in the interest of time here, I won't go into all the details of those now, but we'll post the link in the chat and feel free to follow up with any questions. Laura, I think that is all on my end. So back to you. Great, thank you, Aton. I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Hepburn for a NASHMED update. Yes, and I'm just passing quickly over to Amy. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Hepburn. Thank you, Laura. So I was actually supposed to uh, present last week and I didn't get the opportunity to, but I'm I'm happy to say I'm actually glad that happened because I got my Crisis 98 t-shirt uh, during the time. So I got to wear it during my presentation. So thank you again for allowing me to share. I'm gonna share uh, the Nashville update for um, those of you who don't know me, my name is Amy Brinkley and I am the Recovery Support Systems Coordinator for Nashville. I've been with NASHBID since January and I'm still learning a lot and still have a lot to learn. Um, Dr. Hepburn had asked me to share with you a little bit about the recovery summit that was held a couple weeks ago by SAMHSA. So we were one of the lucky few that were able to attend. Um, so for, I know some of the people on the call today were actually there, but I know a number of you weren't because it was a pretty small event. So for those of you who weren't aware of the event, it was hosted by SAMHSA at their headquarters in Arlington, Virginia on August 8th, or I'm sorry, August 9th and 10th. Um, it, the event itself included about 150 national recovery leaders from across the country. Um, the recovery leaders they pulled together were from both the mental health and the substance use recovery space. Um, the event was hybrid, so some people were in person and some people were on Zoom. Um, the incredible thing that I want to give SAMHSA a shout out for is that the um, amount of SAMHSA leadership that was in attendance for the summit was incredible. 
uh, Miriam Delphin Rittman, uh, Tom Coderre, Paolo, Paolo Del Vecchio. Um, I mean, all of the directors were there, CSAT, CSAT, CMHS. One thing I did notice is that Miriam was there working the room, introducing herself, talking to people. And she she wasn't just in and out. She stayed. She was engaged. She stayed. She was committed. And I just think it goes a long way to show SAMHSA's commitment to recovery. So I just wanted to give them um, a shout out. The agenda that was shared uh, with folks before the event was um, what the, the agenda itself was about uh, SAMHSA wanting the group to review the definition of recovery SAMHSA's definition of recovery, the dimensions of recovery, and the guidelines. The overwhelming consensus that I noticed from the surveys were that there really wasn't a large um, desire for pe from people to change the definition, and it seemed to be some uh, mixed reviews on changing the dimensions of recovery. So um, there were some panels, facilitated breakouts, I think the top formal announcements uh, were that the 20 finalists for SAMHSA's Recovery Innovation Challenge were announced. So there's a public, there's a PSA out for that. Um, the National Peer Certification Announcement from Tom Couder addressed that the State of the Union Address, uh, which talked about a national peer certification, um, was actually going not going to be an actual peer certification, national peer certification, but it's going to be more guidelines. So Dr. Larry Davidson from Yale will be leading that effort for SAMHSA, but they are going to be focusing on guidelines, not a national peer certification. So that was one of the other big announcements. And then they're developing a national recovery strategy, which is huge. Um, one of the other key takeaways for me was that this is not a one and done. So this was just the start of them engaging with the recovery community. So kudos to SAMHSA uh, for that. And uh, Nashville's very honored to be part of that. And that's my update. Thank you. Great, thank you, Amy. Yes, lots of kudos for SAMHSA for their commitment and leadership. So thank you. Please share that with the whole team, Aton. Uh, we will move forward. Uh, Aton, can you let us know if there's any recordings of the summit that are available in public? Yes, I will I will circle back on that uh, and report back next week. Okay, perfect. Thank you. And we're just going through quickly uh, some of the summer congressional outlooks here. I'm not sure if Sarah from uh, Guide Consulting or Joanna want to add anything here. Okay, no worries. Uh, not much uh, is happening given the August recess, so we will move forward. All right, Paul, I will turn it over to you, Kana, as well, if you all want to make a couple of remarks about the calculator. Sure, I'm happy to say a couple of things. Um, you know, McKinsey and Company did a lot of research to uh, get data informed pieces specific to each of your state. So I, I would say this, uh, as state leaders, those of you looking at utilizing this, um, when you see the average cost for inpatient, average length of stay, uh, those are actually driven by Medicare and commercial claims that were accessible. And so they are very specific to your state. But many of you, of course, know the Medicaid space and payer information as well. So as you start thinking through those things and utilizing it, I would consider putting in a balance. Not all those Medicaid claims were readily available state by state, which is why I think that approach was used. But, but again, it gives you a real data informed state specific piece. And I think the other thing, Kana, uh, your team really did well, was they leaned into this assertion of 200 crisis episodes that require face to face uh, per 100,000 residents. And they dug deeper and they actually used a number of, again, claims data, uh, justice system and first responder data to get to the 230 number that's now applied to the calculator. So. I love the real deep dive that your team did to get this to a better and stronger place. Thanks, Paul. And, and thanks, obviously, to the RI team that uh, gave us, <laughs> spent lots of time together to work on those numbers and, and uh, land on those uh, pretty robust assumptions, I think. Um, but the other great part about the tool is that for those of you who want to play with the numbers, you have different uh, want to make different assumptions, different rates, you can also do that. Uh, so I think this is, it's very customizable. So there's kind of the, um, you know, depends if you want a bite, a snack or a meal, you, you 
like kind of take the visual that's already there, or you can go in and take it with the default assumptions for your state or community, or then you can go in and really uh, dig in and put in the numbers uh, for the more advanced user or for someone who really has a specific use case. Um, you can also do that, which I, I think gives us a, a flexibility that we didn't quite have uh, on, on the RI tool previously. Uh, and having spoken to a number of state leaders, uh, I think people have been able to put this to, to fairly good use uh, in their planning work. Thanks, Kana and Paul. I will echo that, uh, that a lot of states have said that this has been very helpful. And you can see on the visual here, just having that diversion, right? When we are taking a really holistic look at the crisis continuum, we can save a lot of dollars. And I know that's important to states. Uh, I'm going to see if Dr. Hepburn uh, or Amy Cohen want to talk us through a future resource, the APA calculator. Um, Amy or Dr. Hepburn, are you all available? Uh, it, yeah, Laura, I'm sorry. I, technology and I don't get along very well. Uh, so uh, thank you. Yeah, the, there are a couple of nice calculators out there now. And of, of course, the one that uh, uh, was just discussed is excellent and very helpful to the states. There's a new one that just came out from the American Psychiatric Association and might be good to have uh, a presentation on it to this group. But uh, the American Psychiatric Association came out with a paper that uh, it was supposed to be a bed paper, but it, it ended up being more of a resource paper uh, looking at all beds and what would happen if there was a good continuum of care and uh, what would be the impact on bed needs. So the calculator, calculator is very nice, but it's not just a simple how many beds do you need? It's uh, more complicated than that, and it looks like it may be a good resource. Uh, our understanding is that there, it's being tested by University of Michigan, and we'll try and get people more knowledgeable about this uh, in future uh, calls. But uh, just real quickly, it seems to be a nice uh, resource, and it looks at uh, bed needs for local jurisdictions when you take into consideration the uh, continuum of care, including crisis services. So as we get more of the information on that, we'll pass it along. So thank you, Laura. Thank you, Dr. Hepburn. I definitely would uh, love to have that as a potential featured presentation. Uh, I also wanna note that SAMHSA has, Aton from SAMHSA has dropped into a chat, uh, a link to register for an event at the end of this month for, uh, International Overdose Awareness Day. So make sure that you have that information and are able to register if you're interested. Uh, so moving us through, uh, again, we have Moving America's Soul on Suicide. This video series has been very powerful, profiling uh, individuals who may have experienced loss or are attempt survivors. Uh, if you have time, please check this out. Really great. Um, um, really great uh, uh, kind of video series to have. Uh, next week, our feature presentation will be 911 EMS in crisis. And we'll have Katie Elkins, who has over two decades of experience in this, talk us through. This has been a hot topic amongst uh, policymakers at all levels, uh, individuals with lived experience, the public, uh, how 911 EMS uh, will interface with 988 uh, in, in some of those considerations. So we're very much looking forward to that presentation. All right. And then just taking a look ahead. So we are uh, again next week talking through EMS and 911. We'll have Dr. David Jobes uh, talking through uh, suicide risk September 7th. Uh, just a note again, we will be off for October 5th uh, for uh, Yom Kippur. So there will be no crisis jam that week. Uh, but then the following week, we'll be coming back for the 100th episode. And again, we will have a challenge. Uh, so please uh, be sure to tune in. Uh, and then we'll be hearing from our friends at AFSP uh, regarding their Project 2025 
uh, as well as from the Kennedy Satcher Center for Mental Health Equity. Again, all very important topics. If you have topics that you would like to present, please feel free to uh, uh, contact Karen. We want to make sure that we are providing information that is useful and showcasing a variety of perspectives and sharing best practices. And I will agree here with Amy on October 12th, be sure to wear your shirt uh, for that celebration. So thank you all for spending the last hour with us. Thank you, Dr. Roselle, um, and really appreciate all that you all are doing to transform the crisis continuum. Thanks everyone.